Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. Right, well, hello and welcome to uh, what is my second ever uh, Teachers Talk radio uh, broadcast. And it is an absolute pleasure um, to be back and to be um, talking tonight uh, with two other fantastic uh, primary school head teachers leaders. Um, and we're going to have a little think tonight about what it's like at this time of year. Um, we've got um, Kate Overbridge, um, who has been a head for a very long time, an executive head, and many others. I'll let her introduce herself uh, in a bit. And we've got uh, Dave, who's just started his second headship. Um, and I don't think the two of you know each other, although you might correct me uh, in a bit. Um, so, um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is uh, Claire Bills, and I um, am into my second year of my second headship. Um, I was head at a very small rural school in Nottinghamshire for five years, and I'm in a much larger uh, 1.5 form entry primary school, still in Nottinghamshire. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of ads from our sponsors, and I'm going to get Kate and Dave to introduce themselves, and we'll jump in. Um, so tonight, our two sponsors, uh, we've got Futurum Careers, um, who provide a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19-year-olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. They help teachers to show te their students what they can aim for and how. Uh, from articles to activity sheets, animations to podcasts, all the resources align with Gatsby benchmarks and are free to download. Uh, their website is Futurum Careers, F-U-T-U-R-U-M, careers.com, and you can subscribe today. Um, and the other one is John Cat. Um, and the show is brought in partnership with John Cat Educational, uh, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Level up your professional development today and visit John Cat Bookshop, J O H N C A W T Bookshop.com to explore the few full range of titles. Uh, there's a code J C T R 2425 for 20% off. Right, let's jump in. Um, Dave, if you're able to unmute yourself, would you like to introduce yourself, who you are, uh, your history, how you find yourself in the job you're in currently? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, I've been a head for the past 10 years, um, and I've just started my second headship uh, this week. Uh, that's been interesting. Um, before that, uh, so I'm overall, I've got 29 years experience in teaching, um, which has gone very quickly. Um, and um, yeah, I kind of I kind of connected with Claire originally because um, I noticed on Twitter uh, or X that you've had a kind of similar sort of move to me in terms of moving from quite a small rural school um, to a much larger school, which is what I've done in the last term. Um, uh, the last uh, this week, in fact. So um, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, it's a church school as well. I probably ought to say that's quite that's quite important to me. I've got quite a passion for working in the in the uh, Church of England school sector. Fantastic, thank you, Dave. Um, Kate, do you fancy just doing a little mini bio for us as well? Hello, um, hi Claire. I've um, this is my twenty first year as a head. Um, and my 31st year in teaching, so I graduated in 93, my first century was in 2004. I did three regular headships in London boroughs, inner and outer, and then moved out of London. And for the past nine years, I've been an exec head at uh, the school I'm at now, which is a split site uh, school. So I've got an infant site, I've got a junior site. Um, during that time, I've also done a couple of um, interim exec heads. With, we're taking on schools in a bit of trouble um, for the local authority. Um, I also do office inspecting and my schools have been church schools and not church schools. Um, yeah. Ah, right. Big, big and small. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. And um, I asked uh, both of you, um, because I've connected with both of you, I guess, on X on Twitter, um, and seen similarities and differences in the journey, but I thought it'd be really good tonight. Um, I feel that one year into my second headship, there's loads to learn, but 
also, Kate, having been at the same school for nine years, or executive head across the same schools for nine years, um, so much to, to take away and think about when we think about how we start the year really well. So, Dave, how has, you know, day one, two, three, your inset day, how's it gone at your new school this year? Um, it, it's been great, to be fair. Uh, it's, at the moment, it kind of feels like it's the longest week I've ever had in my life, um, uh, even though it's only been three three days. And I think that's probably because I was playing out the first couple of days for the last six weeks in, in an awful lot of detail. So it kind of feels like I've been living them for a long time. But um, uh, I had a good inset on the first day with the staff, uh, and that was that was really it was really positive. Um, and then, of course. You know, what, what we're in it for is uh, to spend time with children, really, isn't it? And uh, I've had a lovely couple of days, uh, the last two days. I've kind of prioritised just, just trying to speak to children as much as I possibly can uh, over the last over the last uh, two days or so. Although it's been difficult today because it's amazing how quickly you suddenly find yourself um, up to your eyeballs in, uh, in, in emails and, and sort of jobs to do uh, and so on. But, yeah, no, it's been really uh, it's been really positive. Um, I've often found in the past when I've, when I've moved jobs that, um, it's it's kind of like uh, you get a real lease of life. I think when you go to a new school because it's exciting. It's a different community and it's a different site and it's a different set of children, a different set of staff, and all that sort of thing. So, no, it's been fun so far. Hope it continues. Oh, that's great! And isn't it nice to hear positivity about doing headship? Because I feel like you hear a lot of uh, those people who feel a bit ground down, perhaps. Um, we'll come on to kind of how the how things feel a bit more on a national level in a bit. Kate, how's your start to the year been? It's been really good. Um, it's is is a bit odd actually because my business manager um, retired uh, last week. So I've got a brand new business manager, really experienced business manager, but brand new to our school at the same time as one of my heads of school moved on. So we've got an interim head of school um, at one of my sites. So my SLT is completely different and feels um, positive, very efficient, um, but isn't what I was. It's not the SLT I left in July. So even though, you know, you, you're there for ages, things change around you. And so getting to grips with my new SLT was really important and they're doing great. Uh, we had a couple of inset days. Um, I did something this year that I've never done before. I mean, for goodness sake, so 22, 21 years into it and I've only done it for the first time, what an idiot, where we gave all the subject leaders five minutes just to say to the rest of the staff, these are the priorities from my subject for the year, you know, started for the art lead saying everyone's doing really well, really pleased with how we're doing this. But this year we're getting new sketchbooks and this is how I want you to use them. And it was just really great hearing their visions and here, I'm going to tweet, um, I put it on um, on the other site yesterday about how um, <laughs> it was really obvious listening to more talk, how embedded our practice is now. And I said to one of my interim heads of school that was there when I started, you know, nine years ago, the staff would not have spoken like that. It was just really, really great to hear. So it's, it's you know, sometimes you get those opportunities at the beginning of the year to actually hear how much people have learned, how hard they have worked and, and how much they're looking forward to things. Yeah, that's interesting. So we did actually a really similar thing midway through the year, last, um, last academic year. Um, but I think it's so valuable uh, to do that and to give teachers that time. And actually, they really respect and value having that. Mm. So that's fab. So I guess as an exec head, it's a little bit different. But um, what does it look like, I guess, to kind of set the tone, to share the vision, the plan, the development plan for the school um, when you've been there quite a long time? And I guess in some extent, some of the things that you started off wanting to achieve you probably have achieved and though you never really stop I guess no you never really stop Claire Seeley always says that the curriculum is like painting the fourth bridge as soon as you finish you got to start again and I think that's very much so I mean when when I first took my job on there wasn't really a curriculum that certainly that followed through from the infants to the juniors we didn't have any kind of medium-term plans or anything like that and now we're at a point where the medium-term plans are on maybe their third or their fourth version with tweaks happening all the time and people adding taking stuff out whatever so that that's really encouraging um and now my menopause brains made me forget what you asked me to talk about <laughs> <laughs> no I was just talking about like how do we share vision like oh, at the start of yeah, the year? It's, it's, and what that looks like, your role, head of school's role? It's so, so this is where I find that, and I don't know whether how other people feel what Dave thinks, but where sometimes I'm everything, oh, 
blinking neck, here we go again with this thing. But you can't say that to the staff because for some of them, it's going to be brand new. Some of them, it's going to be new to them at this school. So you kind of have to keep things really fresh and exciting, even when you're thinking, oh, here it comes again. We've done this before, you know. Um, and it's, it's another reason why I'm always looking for a different spin on things like the safeguarding training and stuff. So it's not just the same old, same old every year and they switch off. Um, so I try and keep the sort of, oh God, to myself and have the outward or within the SLT and have the outward bit as the, you know, it's this and it's this and we're doing that and this is great and this is fantastic and keeping it positive that way. Yeah, and I love your honesty, Kate, because I think there are moments when we all feel exactly like that. And we go, right, how do I sell this? I got a chat GTTP to turn my school development plans into kind of street talk. Uh, to <laughs> put the in. <laughs> you know, just to be like, here's what uh, the cool kids are saying we're doing. And here's what it really means. But just that two seconds of humour to break up something that otherwise yeah. is, let me tell you, our full objective. You know, like, is it? It's about getting it right, isn't it, and connecting with people. So, Dave, you've been at the school for two or three days. I remember very vividly what's standing up on my first day in front of the staff on day one of the inserts going, how do I share my vision and plan for a school that I don't really know enough about to do this? How was that for you? Yeah, yeah, that that was that was interesting to be honest, and I, I kind of agree with what Kate was saying about you know sometimes you've got to think. You, it feels like you're saying the same blinking things over and over again, <laughs> and finding, and that was actually one of the reasons why I was looking for a new job because mm -hmm. after ten years in the, in my first school, much as I loved it, it did kind of feel like I, I'd run out of um, new ways to say things um, to the staff and new ways to do things and so on. I think um, uh, it's it was it was. Um, it was funny how nervous you get, actually, you know, even though I was, uh, I was kind of been all right about uh, changing jobs. But just as I got up in front of the staff, I did suddenly feel actually I'm really quite nervous about this, um, probably because there's like three times as many staff as there was in my previous school, because I've gone from small school to, to large school. Um, I think I was quite honest with them and said, uh, really, you know, what? I think it remains to be seen what I'm going to do exactly with the school, because I'm trying to my my aim was all about gathering information really at the moment mm -hmm. um then because of the circumstances of the school my main message i was trying to get over to my staff was really uh, one of reassurance it, it's a school that's had a, a huge amount of uh, it's had quite a bit of instability over the last few years and um then quite a lot of change as well has been forced uh, on staff um for lots of reasons uh and actually um They've made some really good progress over the last year, but because it's been quite turbulent, um, and also because they had a, they had a good offset last year, so we're not we've not got that hanging over our heads, which is which is nice. Um, there's no need for radical change straight off. I've actually been quite impressed with a lot of the systems they've already got in place. Um, some of the uh, practices seem an awful lot uh, better than I was, um, and more thorough than I was expecting. So I talked to a lot of them really about re about reassurance and actually that uh, that what that you know sweeping changes and ripping everything up and starting again was, wasn't going to happen. But inevitably, you know, we were going to do a lot of information gathering to find out how we can um, not make changes. I don't think that's the right word, but what exactly we need to we need to prioritise in the coming year. Yeah, definitely. And I remember, you know, you're nervous, I was nervous, a lot of the staff mm -hmm. were nervous. And I think mm -hmm. for me, that, that last year was definitely about just trying to build that team. You know, and the school I went into was quite fragmented at the start, you know, because there'd been changes in leadership, got new deputy and new head kind of starting. And therefore, that was so important that you, you get that right. Um, and I think, yeah, spending time listening and finding out what the right thing to do is um is really important um and i think staff would really value that so i you know i think that's that's fab um i don't know about either of you i'm a big uh words person i mean fascinating since i'm actually dyslexic so i can't ever spell any of the words that i talk about but i love um reading over the summer and that is the definite mm -hmm. In me I remember in my interview they asked me to do like a all about me kind of presentation and I just kind of basically put up like loads of books that I really like both educational and non and I was like that pretty much sums up me um and one of the words that I came across this summer um was mellorism 
um, which was the belief that we can contribute to positive change and improve the world through acts of love, creativity, compassion and kindness. And there's something about that that really resonated with me and I think is one of the words that I'm kind of going to hold on to this year. Because I think when we talk about what is it about vision and plans for developing a school, it can be so easy, can't it, to jump on data or to look at kind of SIAMs or Ofsted inspections, if it's in a church school, obviously, or none, um, and think is, what's the next step? What's the next driver? What's the group that I need to focus on? And to, to stop and step back and go, actually, if we were to look at our curriculum through a different lens and think about how we're equipping staff and children, really, um, to change the world in different ways and discover um, what it is about them that um, really is encouraging or empowering um, is one of my kind of challenges and thoughts um, for this year. I don't know if that resonates with you. I don't know if that's anything that you've ever led a school development plan on, Kate, or led shared in vision. It's, I think the longer I was in headship for the more schools I worked in, the more brave I got about saying, no, I'm not doing it like that. Um, and that doesn't, that's not just schools that I worked in that were already Ofsted good and we don't have to worry about anything, but also when I was in RI school and we had to move it to good. If, I, you know, if a local authority um, says, here's the format for your, your self-evaluation form and here's the format for your school development plan and I don't like it and I don't think it's going to work for our children and our staff, then I'm going to not do it because I'm going to do it my way or the way that the staff want to do it, because it's, it, you know, none of those documents are statutory. They cannot say you have to use our format. And I've kind that's kind of been my approach for quite a long time now. Uh, it wasn't like that when I first started because I did everything by the book because I was scared I'd get told off. And then once I realised, actually, you don't really get told off if you've got a good reason behind what you're doing and your school's not vulnerable in a vulnerable position, Ofsted wise, you've got a lot more clout. So, um I've done that for a long time. When I first started in my current authority, um, the they were st this, so this was nine years ago. They were they were asking for targets, uh, t attainment target, achievement targets for all U groups for each term of the year, and I said I'm not giving you those because I don't have to set them. They said, oh, you have to give them to us. I said I don't have to give them. And in the end, um, I had to, I said to them. <laughs> This is so bad, really. I said, if you can show me the statutory instrument that shows me I have to comply, then I'll do it. And what happens now is they don't collect those targets anymore. They didn't do it for about two years after because I did it. And then all, a lot of people in my cluster group did it. Yeah. And then they obviously realised there was this little geographical map around my school of schools that weren't doing it. And they changed their approach. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for me. So I often... If, if the school is not in a vulnerable position in Ofsted wise, because as far as I'm concerned, even as an Ofsted inspector, as a head, your Ofsted is really your armour. If you've got a good or better Ofsted, it is a suit of armour that stops them coming back and back and back and sending the local authority or the mats back and back and back and can leave you alone to do what you want to do, because what you want to do is probably going to be the best thing for your children and staff. So it's been a long time since I've looked at an Ofsted report or a data report or a local authority format for something and gone, yes, we're going to use this. We know, what our school, we know our school, we know what we want to do with it. And it's almost, let's work backwards from that. It's the same with the same thing that I do with appraisals with the staff, you know, rather than going, okay, what's the objective going to be? We say, what do you want to achieve? And let's work backwards from that. You want to achieve this? How are we going to do it? And why are we bothering? Oh, there's the objective there. And that's kind of the approach I take to everything now. So if I was saying anything to heads out there, I would say, if it's not actually, you don't have to do it. Do it your own way. What's going to work for you and your kids and your staff? I'm yeah, you know what? That makes, I guess, I, 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 yeah, that that makes me laugh actually, because I've got I, I totally I totally agree with you. And I think um I think um I would say I take exactly the same approach. I think as I got further into headship, I started questioning why we were doing certain stuff or yeah. or why why was I supposed to fill this particular school development plan format in? Um yeah or whatever, um, just because I've been on a course for it or the governors wanted this or they wanted that or whatever. So, yeah, I've definitely got that the road to say, I'm just going to do it my way. Uh, but you are right, if you've got that good Ofsted, um, yeah. it does basically, like, it gives you a bit of backup, isn't it? I think it's, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's very, very challenging if you're in a particularly, um, if you're meant to be driving up standards. I think we're all trying to drive up standards, aren't they? I always find that. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, you know, we're driving up standards at this school because we're RI, well, Aren't we trying to do that 
we're all trying to do that, aren't we? Um, but I think you get braver as it. The more, the longer you've gone into headship, the braver you get to just say, Definitely. I'm going to do it my way because it'll work my way. And I also think there's an awful lot of work heaped on to head teachers that probably probably don't need to do or, how, or, or probably don't need to write down. It's probably a better way of saying it. You know, we could do endless and endless paperwork, which people very rarely read, you know. So for, I'm all for streamlining it as much as possible um, to give us better time to actually impact. I think that's great. And I think what's fascinating is you kind of it, naturally drawn into two lines of uh, dialogue there, aren't we? There's the frustration, and I'm sure, Kate, even as an Ofsted inspector, you feel this, that when you're in the window is probably the area when you can least confidently do the school development that you really need to do yes, because yes. the risk of it not yes. being fully embedded and therefore seen as a weakness yes. is what kind yep. of drags you down. Yep. Um, and also the way that we kind of want to link all these things we're doing and where we're taking the school of the year with, well, what does that look like for teachers and teaching assistants? What kind of appraisal targets would that mean and work its way out? And, you know, I um, was delighted when performance related pay was announced, it was gone. And I remember saying to my governors and someone from the local authority, so I know technically it will still be here for this year, but since we're not going to be having the conversations, shall we just assume it's already in place? Because realistically, mm. you know, I want to set the right objectives that are right for that member of staff that yeah. move them forward and have, you know, exciting opportunities and high expectations. And, you know, if they don't complete every box, well, that shouldn't be what stops them from getting the pay grant that they That's deserve. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's because it's not about box ticking. The box ticking is the recording of it. It's that's not what it, that's not the the process. The process isn't the important part. It's what the person does with that and what they learn from it. So yeah, it's not about think, the box ticking. It's about how have they improved. Absolutely, and the other thing was schools are quite organic places as well. And I I, I frequently not met um, you know performance management objectives because actually the circumstances of the school over the course of the year have changed mm. things yeah. have changed as we've gone along and actually we've had to say well actually we can't focus on that right now because this has mm. come up and that's a priority or actually um we've actually boxed something off an awful lot quicker do you know what i mean so you, you can yeah. you something sometimes go the goes the way that actually you know your time's been taken up by something that's come along um that you've had to spend priority on and as a result you haven't managed to do things that have been on on your on on on, on appraisal documents or you know mm. i don't think there's, is there's nothing wrong with getting to the end of the year and say and looking at the school development plan objective and say we haven't achieved that you know um because sometimes you don't because things yeah. take longer you can't always plan exactly how long something's going to take how much it's going to cost all those sorts of things you know it's fine to say well we've made good progress to it actually we've done well we've got towards it we haven't got there we'll just roll it over and we'll carry on with the next year um so I think I remember doing a school development plans that I already knew when I wrote the objective was going to be a two year objective, right? Yeah. <laughs> like that you'll get so yeah. far in the first year and then the second year. And especially in a uh, smaller school that I worked at, you know, when you when you've got ninety eight pupils and four members of staff and they're working mm. absolutely as hard as they possibly could. There's just absolutely. no the pace of change is going to allow you to do everything you want at once. So let's focus on what we want to do and let's do it really well. And let's show that what we can do like that, because it's far better to do less well than try and do loads mm. and then do a kind of half job at it. And, and the flip side of that in the large school is you might have more people to do it, but that means you've got more people to make sure they're implementing it and more people to make sure yeah. they actually understand what they've got, they've got to do. So it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's a different issue, but it's still an issue in terms of getting that change moving and getting people. Yeah. It and it's getting that balance between, I think what I found last year was, oh, great. I've got people who've got capacity, who've got desire. Brilliant. Let's do this, this, this. And then you get to part way down the road and you're like, whoa, too much. Like, and having not had that for six years, suddenly I was like, actually, because you've got so many people, and I'd worked in much bigger schools even than I am now, previously as assistant heads in different leadership roles, but you just kind of go, actually, it all feels a bit overwhelming. And Ooh. the other word that I shared with staff was yatori, which is a Japanese word for intentionally slowing down to simply be, yeah. listen, and appreciate the richness and beauty 
of life and nature. And I was kind of saying to staff, I want to commit that your well-being matters this mm. year and that as much as there might be 101 fantastic things that we would love to do, you will burn out if I don't make that decision to go, we're not doing everything. Yeah. And sometimes we might have to cancel a staff meeting because actually this just isn't the time and people just need to stop and slow down because maybe something's happened in the community or maybe actually you just need some time in teams to do what what really matters most to you now. But I, I just I do worry that we kind of get dragged into um so many exciting things and I think Kate you're probably far wiser than me at not looking at crazies and things and going oh that's interesting that cool. sounds good oh, let's when the, that what you, go. you mean when that email comes through going being part of this exciting project it's going to be this and it's going to be that and you can get a thousand pounds to do this and that and the other and you just think do you know what I don't need that thousand pounds for the hassle that's going to be and I don't know who's going to lead it we don't need to worry about it I'm just going to delete it but then what then normally happens is one of my heads of school goes did you see that email about that exciting thing I'm like oh god <laughs> Um, but no, it's, and there are, and you know, don't get me wrong. There's some brilliant things out there that people send you. But if you did every single thing that people say, this is a great thing, do it. You would never get anything done, you know. And um, it's it, yeah. It, so and some things are brilliant, and other things you just think, oh gosh, I just can't. Oh, I can't do it now. I want to do it, but I can't do it now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Dave, that was my thing last year. Was going right. I'm just gonna not just hold on to some things yeah. like someone way wise so just have a book and say to people when they think of so throw these ideas at you just write them down and ponder them a little bit first and it definitely thinking like a whole year cycle through as a school you feel so much more confident knowing what works mm -hmm. what doesn't what are the pinch points at this school with these staff yeah. you know with things set up in routines and systems as they are what was hard how do we make that easy? What do we definitely not add to that time of year? Um, and it's just being able to reflect and know just because something worked in one way at one school doesn't mean it will work Absolutely. in a different school. I think that's that's a real danger, isn't it? Yeah. That actually, you yeah. know, people think that things are all, you know, lots of things are transferable between schools, but not everything is. And, yeah. you know, it's a bit like lessons, I think. Well, you know, so I don't teach but much these days, but, you know, one lesson that works with one class that works brilliantly it doesn't always work again uh, with another bunch, does it? And it's the same with these sorts yeah. of things. So, you know, some, some, some initiatives work well. I'm being really kept, what I'm trying to do at the moment, uh, I'm making an absolute point of not referring to what I did in my old school, oh. um, not even in front of the staff. You know, it's, okay, you know, it's conversations we've had with uh, uh, my deputy. And I, you know how I've been very fortunate to inherit what I think is, is going to be an absolutely fantastic deputy for me, who's been incredibly supportive uh, ever since I was appointed, really, um, which is a massive bonus uh, when you go into school like that because... You know, when you know already someone's got your back, okay, but has yeah. a wealth of knowledge about the staff already. Um, so, you know, I'm running everything by her. Anything we're going to think of putting in, we're going to be running it by someone who's been there for quite a, a number of years already and, know, and knows a lot of people. But definitely, I don't want to be... And the other thing you don't want to be doing is just recycling. When you go to a new school, yeah. I just I don't go there just to recycle what I did in the last place mm -hmm. at all. I wanted it to be able to do, uh, you know, new and different things with different people. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. And it it, it, it saddens me sometimes when you see um, a head who's been really successful in a school and then, I don't know, maybe they take on an exec headship and they take on another school and they try and make that school like the original school Mark II. Mm -hmm. And you just think, but it's not the same. It's not going to be the same. I thought, well, that's a real shame because each school has got its own, you know, as you say, Dave, there's things you can take from one school to another easily. And there's other things yeah. that aren't transferable at all because the personalities are different of the staff or the community is different or the finances are different. There's always something that means you can't always um, replicate things. And, 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 you know, and I don't want to because that would be boring. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's interesting, we haven't really talked about Matt's and local authority. I've gone from... Uh, you know what, that, I was exact, I was just thinking about Matt's as you were saying that, actually. So I, I didn't know whether to go off track with it, but I think that is a danger that we hear sometimes from some of the, uh, not all, but some of the Matt's, that when they take a very top-down approach to their schools uh, by saying that we all do this and we all do this and we all do this, it fails to recognise that, you know, you get, it doesn't work like that. 
it doesn't yeah. work and schools need their own autonomy you know there are some things which i think um I, i'm not i'm not for a minute um um arguing for or against mats because i've worked in a mat and i'm currently just moved out of a mat to work in in, in my current school and i was and i very much enjoyed working in it um but I think uh, there's some advantages to having some like uh, central uh, systems that work well for all schools. But you have to keep yeah. um, things that are going to retain your own school image and your own school yeah. identity uh, and, uh, and so on. And I think sometimes I, I you know, it's, sometimes it's hearsay, but you hear a story thinking, oh, that will put me off um, jo- joining a mat because of the way they run yeah. it. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. How can you show your students the opportunities that await them? How can you fuel their aspirations and motivate them to achieve? Futurum Careers provides a wealth of stimulating resources aimed at encouraging 14 to 19 year olds to pursue careers in STEM and SHAPE. We help you to show your students what they can aim for and how, from articles to activity sheets animations to podcasts all our resources align with gatsby benchmarks and are free for you and your students to download visit futurumcareers.com and subscribe today futurum careers helping teachers to inspire the next generation this is teachers talk radio and this is teachers talk radio news BBC News reports on the uncertainty over the future of vocational courses, with over 450 schools and colleges in England saying they are unsure which courses they can offer in 2025. The government is conducting a review of post-16 education, and the Department for Education says this will support BTEC students. But the results of the review will not be out until December. This means schools and colleges are unsure which courses they can offer students in September 2025, despite having open days scheduled in the coming weeks. 450 schools have written to the government saying that the uncertainty is making it extremely difficult to plan for the future. Not only can they not tell prospective students which courses will be on offer, they can't tell staff either. More than 200 vocational qualifications, including BTECs and other post-16 courses, were due to be scrapped under the previous government. But, days before the first funding changes were due, Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson said there would be a pause and review. The 455 schools and colleges in England have joined the Protect Student Choice campaign, a coalition of 25 education organisations and unions. The review comes against a backdrop of issues that have plagued the rollout of T-Levels, introduced three years ago. Ms Phillipson confirmed T-Levels will continue, despite high dropout rates and issues with exam boards. Schools Week highlights the names of the 12-strong panel appointed by government to review the curriculum and assessment. It follows the appointment in July of Professor Becky Francis, the Chief Executive of the Education Endowment Foundation, to lead the review. The panel includes Academy Trust Chief Executives Cassie Buchanan and Dr Vanessa Ogden, SEND consultant Gary Auburn and exams expert Professor Joanne Baird. It also includes REACH Foundation Curriculum Director John Hutchinson and Funmilola Stewart, who leads on equality, diversity and inclusion across the Dixons Trust. Professor Francis said, we have ensured that primary, secondary and post-16 sectors are represented 
and added that alongside its call for evidence due to launch in September, the review would engage and consult with crucial stakeholder groups and work closely with education staff on the ground. Full details of the panel can be found in the article on the Schools Week website. Hundreds of students are set to miss out on Freshers Week because their accommodation will not be ready. This is according to BBC Bristol, which says Bristol University brought forward Freshers Week so students living in the new Bedminster Metalworks block will struggle to attend events as the residents will not open until the 14th of September. The university says the 819 students affected will be compensated and has offered £250 and promised extra events. But student union officers say the news leaves a sour taste. Legally binding contracts for the new accommodation mean that moving in date cannot be changed. The university brought the Freshers' Week date forward after a review of its academic year. In Wales, record numbers of pupils are being educated out of mainstream schools, according to new figures. The figure of 2,279 is more than twice what it was in 2009-10 to and 28% higher than before the pandemic. The Welsh Government said since the pandemic there had been an increasing demand for provision other than at school, including for physical health and mental health, as well as issues such as anxiety. The figures released do not include those educated outside of school due to parent choice. This has also been rising. Full details of this story can be found on BBC Wales. Finally, The Guardian reports that cleaners at a prestigious UK girls' school have won a dispute over pain conditions. A strike that was due to take place next week has also been called off. The group of cleaners belonging to the United Voices of the World, a grassroots trade union for low-paid migrant workers, voted to strike after the school's contractor wanted to reduce their working time from 43 to 38 weeks a year but offered only a £1.55 hourly pay rise in return. After the vote and appeals from teachers and former students, the contractor offered more pay, annual increases and to meet the London living wage from next year. Whilst the James Allen's Girls' School, known as JAGS, declined to comment, it is understood that former pupils distributed leaflets about the strike and called on the school's leaders to set a good example to its pupils. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Yeah, is is you, you know, well, I don't want Stepford schools, you know, we don't, I don't want everything to be the same. It's um especially when you think of you know when you have those children at your school sometimes where we well, get it both ways, I found. You get have children that join your school because another school that they're at didn't suit them. And then you get children that leave your school because your school doesn't suit them and they need to go to a different one. If all the schools are the same, then there's going to be a section of kids that are going to miss out because that those that, that type of school won't suit them and there won't be an alternative. Um, and that's really sad. And that, that's one of the things I think, you know, I mean, I, I make no secret of it. I put it on, on Twitter and X, you know, I'm a practicing Christian. My school isn't a church school at the moment, but I'm really passionate in my school at the moment that we don't do things that church schools do because we're not a church school and the community needs, there's a lot of church schools near us. Um, and I feel that parents need to have a choice of whether they send to a church school or not a church school. So even though I am a fully signed up church warden, um, PCC, <laughs> whatever you want to know, um, Christian, I still feel it's really important that my school is not church based because we are not. The parents need to have that choice and that option. And it's the same principle, I think, with the mats. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Totally. totally agree. And I think it is one of those fear factor from people in local authority schools, especially you haven't worked in a mat, that joining a mat would mean a kind of top-down, copy-and-paste approach. I like that uh, strap, um, set for the school <laughs> analogy. Um, but I do think, like, so I'm just um, literally about to do my assessment in a couple of weeks, my MPQ uh, EL executive leadership. And there's a lot of conversations around in executive headship models. It's obviously, Kate, what you've got. The advantages yeah. for things that are centralised, you know, from your own workload and life balance, um, but just to also to kind of um, finding what works uh, across schools. But at no point can you ever really get away from what you've just said, Kate, which is that there is a need for different schools. You know, we're in an area where there's quite a large number of schools in quite a small area where I am, and because there's a large number of children. (laughs) Um, But 
when I got my job, my children go to one of the other schools nearby and the head said to me, oh, in competition now. And I went, no, no. we've got to be <laughs> distinctly different. Like, Absolutely. Like, and she was totally only joking. I've got a really good relationship with her. But ultimately, it was about uh, we, people need to be able to choose us because we're the right school or you because you're the right school. Yes. And my role as head is to make sure it's really clear to current parents and to prospective parents what that difference is. And yes. I think what I found last year hard coming in fresh was I didn't really know exactly what was distinct and different and unique and special about the school I'd just joined because I was still discovering and unpicking that because I actually, I remember being asked to interview, like, you know, what are you going to do to make this school outstanding or something like that? And I was like, well, I mean, I'll be I hate that know. question. Yeah, but, so do I. It's not about Why do you want to be me? outstanding? <laughs> well, yeah, indeed. But, but it's also not about me that's going to bring this to school. Yep. My job as the school leader is to uncover and unpick and strengthen and support all those teachers who are amazing mm. and doing mm. wonderful things. And you get a teacher who's really talented at art and suddenly your school can be on fire for the arts. You know, you get a teacher who is absolutely passionate about science or geography, whatever it is. And if you can enable them to flourish well, suddenly yeah. all the teachers in your school are able to do yeah. that and the children are passionate about it. And isn't that, isn't that what we did when we were class teachers? Is that not what we did if we had a child that was really good at something, they lifted the whole class with it? It's exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. so much of what we do is exactly what we did as class teachers with our children. And I don't mean that to patronise the staff. I'm not saying the staff are children, but I'm saying leading a group of people with different talents and different strengths is really similar. And that's what it's about, right? That's why I think I'm a school leader, because I want to have the biggest influence on the biggest number of children. And I do yes. that by getting it right for the adults so the yes. adults can get it right for the children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, so yeah. within Church of England Education, Andy Wolf's done a lot of work on the kind of flourishing schools document. And it's an incredible read and it being taken on by church and non-church schools alike because of the way it's been written to try and engage in terms of how do we change this school system that's dragging down and causing kind of such negative perspectives on what it means to, to teach or to be a mm. school leader or to be a teacher and challenge that to go, actually, in a flourishing system, the adults need to be as successful as the children. Yeah. And if you're in a mat, the matters or the diocese as successful as each layer of this. Uh, to get it right, we need to look in and look out. Um, but that all comes to the leadership, uh, Claire, doesn't it? it? It all comes down to your leadership in any sort of organisation. You know, I, I think it's, I still think it's a great job. Um, yeah. I still think it's a privilege to be in a job where I'm not bored every day because I can't think of anything worse. And, you know, I, 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 I said in my welcome letter to the parents, you know, I've loved my, my, I've loved my time in teaching. I've loved my time in education and still do. But I've been, I was for, I've been fortunate to, you know, I've heard lots of stories about people who've had very difficult experiences with, with leaders and things like that. I was fortunate in that I actually was, I worked for a lot of really good leaders and um, who, who led well and looked after their staff really well. And I learned a lot from that, actually. I learned a lot about how I wanted to go about leading a school. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to lead a school, because I, I'd seen some very bad examples of it and thought I could, I could do better than that uh, in terms of looking after staff. I think you can run a good school um, really well, get great outcomes and have happy children. I think you can do it without running your staff into the ground. Yeah. But not everyone does. No, I, know. Yeah. I don't get that. I just don't get that. Um, and, and that for yeah. me is my Yatori. That's exactly where I came from this start of this year, going, I want people to push back. You know, I, want, I don't want you to wait till you're clinging on by your fingertips. Yeah. I want you to come and speak to me at the point where you're going, that's a lot. And, yeah. and that's, that's perhaps more than I can cope with so that we go, right. And it's not about staff being lazy because very rarely mm. do you have teachers who are yeah. prepared to work really hard for the good of the school, the children, and everyone who makes it. Um, so I wonder, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on to the kind of latest announcements that we've had, I guess. We've got a new government. 
Uh, we've had some new Ofsted announcements this week. Um, and it does feel to me like there is the possibility of a little bit of hope in the system that we might not have had for a while. Um, I don't know what you two, uh, your, your perspective is. We've got kind of a move away from having an overall Ofsted grade. Um, the change to phone calls just being on a Monday. There was lots in the big listen feedback about, you know, fairness and consistency, uh, more information around the, the process for um, those who aren't Ofsted inspectors as well as those who are, curriculum and assessment review. What do you reckon then, Kate? Is it going to happen? Well, I'll tell you what I said to one of my heads of school this afternoon. We were talking about this, about the Monday call or the Tuesday, Wednesday. And because um, we were just had as long, we had an ungraded last year, so we're not in the window. I, I am now done with having Ofsted inspections. <laughs> um, and, and I said to her, I said, you know, if we were, if it was now, if we were in the window now, the, the only thing that is not right in our curriculum at the moment is that's not going well is our RE because we, we've had um, some bad luck with some of our subject leaders and our RE hasn't been developed from the new agreed syllabus two years ago as it, as it should have been. And as I said to my head of school, I'll tell you what we would do. If we were in the window now, we would make Alice the RE coordinator because she works on a Thursday and Friday and then we wouldn't get a deep dive in RE. And that's me saying that coming from the Ofsted. So there's... Although I welcome some of this stuff, I really do. I think it's the, I do think it's moving in the right direction. I'm going to be interested to see how often present it to us as inspectors. Um, but I just think every so many people game whatever system you've got, mm. and that's what's going to happen. You poor, you know, it, you know, if you want to be a part time teacher, you're going to want a Thursday Friday contract, aren't you? Because who wants to be in school when it's the Ofsted? And it, that worries me about how people will play that because I don't mean my staff and my school, but I just mean in general because people always play it. And if I was sitting so, there so, thinking, well, I'd have put my RE coordinator on a Thursday and Friday. So, then hey, so is everybody else. Can I just clarify then? Because obviously I, I've probably maybe misunderstood that slightly. I was on the, I, I mean, I read that the, the phone calls will come on, will come on a Monday now, aren't they? Um, yeah. But presumably if you get one on Monday, your, your inspection will be Tuesday and Wednesday. You can't yeah. get one on a Monday and say, oh, your inspection is Thursday and Friday. It's, that's not well, happening. We, I have to be careful what I say now because I don't, we, we've only had, as office inspectors, we've had quite limited communication about all of this. So a lot of what I know is what everybody else knows from what's been in the media um but i we have been we have been asked to make ourselves available for tuesdays and wednesdays for the rest of term so you know you right well uh, yes that, it's going to be tuesdays and wednesdays so, so that that is interesting what you're saying there because i can see a lot of part-time people yeah. will be select saying yeah thursday and friday yeah. can i work thursday and friday please because i'll never yeah. be involved in the offset well, uh, yeah, inspection you? um that's quite interesting um I mean, I thought the interest about the Monday announcements was... I can see where they're coming from on that. I can see it. I can kind of see it at a positive in that way because I think it was... My wife was waiting for an Ofsted um, and they'd been waiting for months and months uh, last year and they'd literally been waiting for years. They were an outstanding school that hadn't had an inspection for like um, mm. 12 years or so. And literally every week up to Wednesday was like on centre hooks. Um, and I didn't think that was very, that's no good for anybody's well being at all, no. uh, and so on. So, I suppose if you, you've just got the Monday and then you, um, and then, and then you know what's happening, um, I, um, so I can see what I'm saying with that. Um, I see there's a move, uh, there's a little bit of move away from the kind of like the deep, well, we're already moving away from the deep dive stuff for some, for some inspections anyway, but there's definitely moved back towards people outcomes and so on. I don't know whether that'll be data driven or not. Um, I, I was never. Head, I, I, I was, yeah. I was personally. Head, I think it will. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? That's that. From my point, as, as long as they base it on progress, I think it needs to be based on progress measures yeah. rather than attainment. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, Absolutely. by per firstly, the current school. I mean, we're always going to do. We're always going to look good in terms of attainment because we 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 do, um, uh, and that's because of our just circumstances. Um, we get good attainment, um, yeah. but not necessarily better progress than other people, and everyone yeah. uh, start yeah. from a different point. Um, so but again, that that there are ways of gaming that as well, as you say, and yeah. that, that's slight worry. I mean, I was, I was, I was never really, uh, I, I, I wasn't a fan of the, the latest uh framework in any way, shape, or form at all. Actually, I think, um, whilst, whilst I 
Uh, I didn't like the deep dive process. I think there's been far such an emphasis on on foundation subjects across primary age range, where in many places we don't have the expertise uh, for them, and it's very very di- it was very very difficult in a small school with four teachers, you know, mm. to have you know expert subject leaders across the curriculum because the the burden of work, even though it was written in the in the in the in the handbook, to the specs should be aware of that. It was still an awful lot to ask yeah. people. You know, when you've got and if you've got four teachers, the one is an ECT, you've got three teachers. Um, yeah. You know that's yeah. so that sort of thing was very difficult. Um, and I actually think you know what people might disagree with this, but I, I think. In primary education, our, our main responsibilities and uh, our main focus should should be to make sure children can read, uh, can write, um, can can calculate numbers uh, as best they possibly can, but also have a bit of a love for learning of other subjects, but not necessarily know every fact. Because I think ultimately, for me, t- uh, education is about ensuring children know how to learn. And they have the skills to know how to learn. I often used to say, you know, I, I still don't know everything I need to know to be a head teacher. I definitely don't. I don't think no. we ever do. Um, but I do know where to go to find it out. And I do know how to find that out. And I do know how to learn it for myself. Um, and I think that's that's the sort of philosophy we ought to be instilling in, in, in children. I'm not saying don't teach history, geography, all those. Of course not. But I think there's, there was, if you get a deep dive in some of those subjects, it could be very, very challenging. Mm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think the natural... <laughs> I say don't get drawn into phrases, but you see things going around, don't you? And we've all been in education for long enough to know that at some point skills will come back and they'll recognise that the priority will go back on to. Actually, it's great to have a head full of knowledge, but you also need to be able to apply it and see things in a new way. I think and it's more important. It. Yeah. 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 And I don't think any of us have really ever let go of that because no. you don't when you're doing the right no. thing. I think schools are still doing it. Says. Yeah. yeah. Um, the progress one is interesting, though. If we're only being looking at what progress is, well, progress from where? From our reception baselines that we still... Well, good. Who knows? <laughs> um, well, that's a bit... Who knows where they're going to measure progress from? OK, but I, I, I was just trying to make the point that, you know, attainment is not really reliable um, yeah. judgment of how well a school's doing, is it? Because, you know, um, certain schools will always have high attainment, Um or higher yeah, attainment than, than others, but it's because it's it, you know, I know I know in my school the starting points for our children are a lot higher than they are for for, for others, which is great for them. But we need to make them; they need to make uh, you know equivalent progress, don't they? And it's it's we um, my local authority is right on the border of Kent, and Kent still do the eleven plus. So when you've got um, schools on the border where the children could well end up at a, 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 um, a Kent grammar school, they get tutored to the nth degree all the way through year six to pass the 11 or through year five to pass the 11 plus at the beginning of year six. And suddenly this school is getting amazing SATS results on the back of the tutoring. And you go into the school and you think, how the bloody hell have they managed this? But ah. if you're just going to look at attainment, then who's going to care? And I have to say, this is going to sound really cheesy, but I will stand, and I will absolutely stand by this. There was something Amanda Spielman used to say to us at, at, at Ofsted that I really, really liked. And she used to say um, that, yes, results are important, but it's equally as important how you get those results. And that I absolutely loved. I might not love everything that Ofsted people say, but that one I thought was absolutely spot on. No, I, I I totally agree with that because um, I think there was I was you know I, I did a lot of year six teaching before I um, before before I came ahead, um, which which I actually loved teaching year six. But I'd be lying if I said I have been in schools where I literally flogged children all year to get through the Sats, yeah. and that was largely under pressure from uh, from leadership to do yeah. that. And that's not what it's about. You don't have to do that. You know, you, you have to be sensible and make sure those children are well prepared. But actually, just spending the whole year doing practice papers, that's not teaching. No, no not at all. And the, the thing that worries me is where where does that pressure come from to the leaders? Is it their local authority? Is it their MAT? Is it Ofsted? What, where is, or is it the pressure, which is what I fear it is a lot of the time, is the pressure is, I've got to explain this properly, Ofsted come in and do the inspection and give a school a grade or whatever what they used to do. But then the pressure is what happens afterwards from the mat or the local authority. So Ofsted don't sack heads, but they can give a, a result of an inspection that makes the local authority or a mat get rid of a head. And so I think there's yeah. responsibility to be taken by those leaders above the leaders as into where that pressure is coming from. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think in schools, Dave, a bit like yours and where I'm currently at, there is a pressure that parents will put on their children and that the children mm-hmm. then put on themselves. And and that's when you oh. do drink and Kate as well, isn't it? You know, yeah. Well that doubt yeah, my school, we're in a we're in a local authority that do the eleven plus. So they're all going to for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, I had a I had a year six in the playground this morning, so it was our first day back, so we had two inset days, Monday, Tuesday. And I had a year six in the playground, um, upset coming in, he's already worrying about SATs and already worrying about going to secondary school. We don't even talk about SATs for months and months and months, yet he's already worrying about it and was worrying about coming to school on his first day year six. And you just think that's just so sad. Yeah, it's not right. That's not right. And and you sometimes see it from the other side. So I've got a, a son who is July <laughs> born, dyslexic, missed year <laughs> one and two, got into year six this year. And I just desperately I hope that he gets a year where he gets that balance right. Like, yeah. do I want him to achieve his potential? Of course I do. But not at the extent of all else. Yeah. You know? And yeah. would I send him to booster groups if they asked him to? Yeah, I probably would. Because actually, if the school are wanting to do, you know, something additional for him, then fine. Do I get him a tutor to help his confidence? Yeah, I do. Like, but... But ultimately, it's about individuals and doing what's right for them. Yeah. Whilst also recognising that when he doesn't get expected in writing, because there is no chance of that, you know, <laughs> <but> it <laughs> his well, work. it depends. Maybe it depends on whether they get moderated, Claire, or not. <laughs> <laughs> Just put that I'm, out there. I'll, I'll be challenging them. I mean, they haven't ever dared to suggest he might be anything like it at any point in his school career. So it would look great, wouldn't it? I mean, last year was the first year he ever got it in reading, but actually that's because something clicked and it was amazing and it was wonderful to see. You know, and on a good paper, he might have a chance at maths, but, but ultimately it won't be about that because he yeah. works so hard and and that's what we need to also find a way to recognize right like that these children who give a hundred percent and don't get there i was i will always remember a child who in a small in the last school i was at so i think we had less than 10 year sixes and one child got 99 on every paper because he was around all his peers who at least in an area had got expected and you know a child who had come to us as a effectively school refuser wanting to run out of school at a young age hiding in corners had gone from that and totally disengaged Mm. to being so close you know but the amazing progress he made was phenomenal it's that we had one, uh, oh God, years ago now, because I think the child's in year 10 or 11 now, but when he was in year one, he scored zero on the phonics screening. When he was in year 10, he did a retake, he scored 19. Now, nobody apart from us in school gave a stuff about that because he didn't get expect, he didn't get the standard, blah, 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 blah. But there was this kid who'd got zero to 19 in a year, which we thought was absolutely blooming phenomenal. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. <laughs> But it's but it's seen as a failure, isn't it? It's seen as a not. It, it's not past it. Um, that, maybe that's, that's the that. mindset we need to move out of. You know, the language around that, and you know, I mean, at one point, I I don't know if the government had given up on it. Wasn't there like a ninety-seven percent they wanted to get everyone to expect it? Yeah, you know, and uh, that's when they yeah. stopped calling it. They stopped calling it national average and started calling it expected because you can't have an yeah. average if you want non yeah, yeah, yeah. to get it. <laughs> I know, and. Uh-huh. I, but then they can never say that X percentage of children haven't met the standard, you know, and yeah. what a disaster it all is. And oh, well, they, anyway. they used to do that thing when it was still levels. They used to see this is how long I've been in the game now. When they used to do levels, oh, no, I've been there. Say, <laughs> you know, X percent of children in this country leave primary school not being able to read. That's not what they meant. They meant yeah. X percent of children didn't get level four. That's what they mean. I mean, they can't read, which means they couldn't read at level four. That's completely different. I hate all that spin on things like that. <laughs> but that's that's <laughs> statistics for you, isn't it? Yeah. They can be twisted exactly. them anyway. 
yeah. you ever get a chance to hear um, Jamie Pembroke speak, I don't know if you've heard him oh, speak I about have. like school data. I mean, it's a most, yeah. it's a hugely entertaining couple of hours where yeah. the whole system just gets destroyed, destroyed by a statistician. It is very funny, yeah. and you do when end up wondering, what are we doing? When he talks about the squirrel outside the window in the Sats test, and suddenly the whole your whole school data's gone to pot because a child went out the window to look at the squirrel and didn't get a mark he should have got, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's brilliant. Uh, guys, you have been amazing. We've only got a few minutes. Um, I'm going to draw it to a close about half past. What I would love to do is ask you both as like one kind of final question. What are your biggest hopes for this year um, at your school? What would you love to be able to this time next year be able to look back and go, oh, we really... I've lost you. Yeah, well, I lost you a bit oh. there, Claire, as well. Let me, let me, Sorry. Didn't get that. Apologies. I'll go again. <laughs> I was just saying, um, if um, this time next year, what would you love to be able to look back on and say, I'm really proud of? This is what I set up wanting to do um, and have managed to achieve. Is there anything you can say already, Dave? Um, wow. Well. What are your hopes? <laughs> I think I've got. I think it's easier to. Um, I think it's easier to answer that from a personal point of view. I think rather than in terms of like specifically what I want to do in school. Um, I was in. I, what I would say was I. I. I had in my previous school was an incredibly special place for me, and it holds. A, it's a place I love forever, um, and I was very happy there. I'd like to look back at the end of the year and think I've had a great year. Um, I mean, when I left, I kind of thought, you know what, the whole thing's been a real load of fun. And I think if I could get to the end of the year and think, you know what, I've had a lot of fun this year, then I think if I feel like that, I would hope um, it's probably felt like that for the children in the school uh, and and the, and the staff in the school as well. Uh, and also, I think if children in the school have been happy all year and staff in the school have been happy all year, then we've probably done a, a pretty good job. That's a little bit, maybe that's a little bit flowery, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um, but yeah, and I, th I think joy is okay. I think we we put this spin on fun that it isn't learning, and and I think it's okay that children should enjoy what they're Ooh. learning about because ultimately it's what makes us passionate. We might not enjoy every single minute of every single lesson with every single teacher in the time we're in school, but actually. I had a load of fun last year and I learned loads about new members of staff and making those relationships with children and families. That was just phenomenal. And sometimes perhaps it's in the unexpected things that you that you do or say yes to or challenge yeah. by that you actually get the most joy out of as well. Yeah. That, that's what that's what I'm hoping for. For positivity, really. I think, yeah. you know, positivity, it will show it's been a good start. And hopefully by the, by the end of the year, I'll know. It was very, I think, like you see, you said yourself, I'm, I'm kind of like looking forward to it, not looking forward to it already, but, you know, you said that going into your second year in, in, in the school well, was so much different over the, over the summer holidays and preparing, preparing for that second year because you knew so much more about the school. Um, and I, I, that's where I want to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it has absolutely been phenomenal. And one of the things that was interesting was that I um, got all our year fives going into year six who were sports leaders to write to all our new reception oh, children. Um, and it's a nice I idea. wrote them a postcard and designed it. And I um, spent a few days <laughs> of my summer posting the ones that were local, and I am, um, as in gay man houses. And my uh, assistant went, Are you mad? Like, maybe in a village school you might go and do that. But there's like 38 children. I was like, yeah, that's okay. And actually, I loved that someone had said that that's a small school head mentality. Because actually, part of what I really didn't want to lose was that really small family feel. And part of the reason I loved being a head was the relationships I had. And, you know, you just want each child to feel special and valued and yeah, loved absolutely. as part of your oh, What an outrageous thing to say. <laughs> small school head mentality. Unbelievable. I took it as a compliment. Yeah, well, okay, well, I think it's a compliment, fair <laughs> I'm enough. I'm proud to be a small school head. <laughs> um, 
Kate, what will this time next year look like? Well, it's going to look completely different because I'm retiring at the end of this academic year. I'm taking early retirement yeah. and headship, um, which isn't a secret. Um, I, I'm, and I will keep working part time, but I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. What I'm my aim for this year is to keep the ship steady so that the change that's coming for everybody on the staff um, isn't too um, horrendous to make sure, that, I mean, I've described the staff as leaving a rental property where you make sure you give it a damn good clean and you get the carpets, shampoo and everything, so you make sure you get your whole deposit back. That's what I want. <laughs> I want to leave that school so the next person can come in and not have to worry about the crap that goes with it because we've got systems set up, we've got everything how it should be, and all they've got to do is come in and decide how they want to do it rather than have to come in and fix things. So my whole aim is to, to, to almost... Um, I don't want to leave a legacy because it's not about me. And when someone else takes the school on, it's their turn. And I don't want people thinking back to, oh, when Kate was able to do this, when Kate was able to do that. I don't want it to be like that because it's not about me. But I do want to make sure I'm leaving it in, I can start crying now, in, in, with everything that we work for, over the, which will be 10 years by the time I go, you know, that everything we've worked for mm. together, that the different teams I've had, different staff that have had children and parents, yeah. that we know, you know, we're doing the absolute best that we possibly can. It's ready for the next person to take it on and run with it. Yeah. Uh, that's really special, Kate. And I absolutely applaud that. And I, I, I mean, Dave will probably remember this as well. I remember really desperately wanting to leave well in my Abs- life. Absolutely. Um, um, wanting to make sure that you leave it in a better place to what you oh, took it yeah. on um, and you set up systems and things that you know for me it was the reasons why I felt I needed to leave I didn't want to become someone else's problem so if I could do something about it to make the job more manageable or the workload uh, easier or things just work more smoothly then that was the opportunity to take them because you've got to try <laughs> got to try to make things better for what's coming yeah but, um they will miss you a lot, Kate, I know, but you've got a whole year still yeah, oh to yes. enjoy that. Oh, but, yes. Um, I think um, I'm sure there will be many tears nearer the time. Oh, well. but, um, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we'll Thank see. you, Brave. We'll see. There's a, lot, there's a while to go yet, so, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Anything could happen, hey? <laughs> Don't say that. Although I did, I have to say, <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I'm retiring is that my mortgage gets paid off in June. And, you know, I did on holiday, I was thinking, oh, that's going to be three, two paydays without a mortgage payment. Oh, imagine if I did another three years without any mortgage payments. And I thought, no, shut up, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah it isn't worth it Kate let's be honest <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just say a massive thank you to both of you for being um, so um, kind to say yes because um, you've both got such fantastic range of experiences and it has been brilliant to be able to just have this conversation about I guess what it's like being a school leader what September's like and um, how you can lead uh, with joy, with laughter, with fun, um, we've delved a little bit into the reasons why um, we lead in the way that we do. Um, I hope that people have kind of got a bit of a sense of um, maybe what it's like <laughs> to be led by people who are really passionate about what they do um, in a, schools of different sizes and different places. Um, Kate and Dave, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I'm just going to end by um, uh, reading our two sponsors and thanking them both um, and then um, we'll call it a night. So um, thank you to um, Future and Careers um, who have a fantastic range of different resources for 14 to 19 year olds for careers in STEM and shape. Um, I'm going to have to look up what shape is because I know what STEM is. You know, Kate? She's gone. Anyway, that help teachers to show their students what they can aim for and how. Lots of articles, activity sheets, animations and podcasts all aligned to uh, Gatsby benchmarks and they're free to download at futurumcareers.com, F-U-T-U-R-U-M, um, and subscribe today. And lastly, thank you to John Catt, uh, educational publishers for professional development books and resources, uh, supporting great teaching and learning in schools around the world. So if you want some new uh, professional development uh, books, there is 20% off at John Cat Bookshop, J O H N C A T Bookshop.com, and the code J C T T R 
2425. Thank you ever so much. Thank you to Teacher Talk Radio. Thank you for Tom for being here. Have a lovely evening. Bye, guys. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.